Boom. Yeah, that's a, that's a job that they can't trust me with. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I've I've lost the the USB pen, which has got the um, which you've got the Brad Cleefort one pager on, which I'm so disappointed by because those icons were. We're, we're well on the line, I've got to say. Um, so um, welcome all. So tonight we uh, welcome David Weston. Um, doesn't particularly need um, an instruction at all. Um, all for this, this, this great book, Unleashing Great Teachers. Also um, CEO of the um, Donovan Teachers Trust. Um, and just this just great. So we, we're so we're so grateful that David's talking to us tonight. Um, sadly, not in Clee Forks, but um, David has just agreed to come to Clee Forks and bring his playlist along. Apparently, uh, '90s bangers and and yeah, that, that's probably where about we are in Clee Forks. We're probably in the '90s at the moment. We're having a whale of a time, aren't we? So, um, so David's going to do a session today on um, expert teachers and uh, developing expert teachers uh, teaching as well. Um, so over to David, and I, I will um, turn my camera off and stop talking because you'll want to listen to. David. Well, listen, thank you so much. And being stuck in the 90s, there was at least some great music. There was some really good music. Um, so listen, I'm, I, I couldn't be happier to uh, speak about anything really than um, developing expert teachers. And um, what I thought I would do uh, was try and focus a little bit on um, what we know from some of the research. I'm going to challenge a few ideas a little bit about the idea of novice and expert teachers, which I think is sometimes a little bit oversimplified. Um, and I'm going to just reflect a little bit on why it is sometimes teachers stop developing. So I'm weaving together a whole bunch of things, some recent papers, and also a new paper out from the Teacher Development Trust as well. So Let's see if I can share my screen effectively here. Right, with a bit of luck, people can see my screen. I hope so anyway. Um, I've got the chat window open and it being a Brewhead event, I would be just absolutely delighted if people wanted to put questions in. I will keep an eye on the questions and I will respond to them just as I see them. So uh, you are very, very welcome to uh, uh, put questions in as I'm going, really happy to make it kind of a bit more discursive. So what is an expert teacher? Um, I think it's worth just reflecting a little bit on um, ex what we think about as experts and then maybe throw a bit of caution in there as well. So the first thing is, when we talk about an expert generally, I'm gonna get all into my cognitive science for a moment here. So established extensive mental schema. So what does that mean? That means, uh, whenever you think of anything uh, in, you know, about being in a classroom or about being a teacher, um, it means that you have lots and lots of associations. So you have loads of experiences, which are all connected together in your brain. You've got loads of vocabulary. You've got loads of different historical things. You've got lots of procedures and habits. You've got uh, loads of concepts and ideas, and they're all really big, rich mental schema. So there's a lot going on in your brain. It's very rich and interconnected. Um, and we'd expect that of an, uh, of a, uh, an established uh, expert teacher. You'd have well-developed procedural knowledge. What does that mean? That means there would be loads of procedures and approaches in the classroom that you, are, you find very natural to do. Um, so that means you, you'd know you'd have a massive toolkit of different teaching approaches that you could use at any time. Um, and not just I follow the instructions one, two, three, four, five, but you'd also be reflecting that actually, well, at this point, I could do five different directions. And at this point, I could do three or four different things. Oh, and if I have to do this at the same time as doing that and the other thing, I can do them all at the same time. So that's why expert teachers can be explaining one concept on the board. They're monitoring the classroom in a constant monitoring pattern they go. They notice someone about to misbehave there. They notice someone else who without a pencil. As they're explaining, they quietly drop a pencil on one desk and then just stand ominously next to the child who's misbehaving. All of this is very, they know all of these different things and they can be combined together. And a lot of it they can do because they have high levels of automaticity, as in they don't actually have to think about, oh my goodness, I need to walk from here to there and I somehow need to deal with that behavior. They just know that by standing nearer there, that's gonna help things. And they can keep most of their mental focus, their working memory on the explanation that they're giving. Um, and then they also have a really high level of perception. So 
where a novice teacher might just be mainly focused on, oh my goodness, what, what's happening on the board right now? I need to say that. Um, an expert teacher can just sweep across the room and pick up really tiny little signs of off-task off behavior or tiny facial expressions that might suggest people haven't understood. They're picking up really minute little uh, elements that are going on. Um, but also, and this is often neglected, they've got a greater perception of their internal sensations. So there's this thing called interoception. Interoception is the sensory signals that come from inside your body. So how tense are my muscles? Do I have any pain internally? Do I have, um, uh, have I just had a release of internal hormones, adrenaline? Uh, how fast is my heart beating? How fast am I breathing? How hot do I feel? Uh, what am I tasting? Um, all those sorts of things and all those sensations from the body, which are then linked to how you feel. So um, a novice teacher might suddenly find themselves faced with a difficult situation and just be overwhelmed by the tight stomach and the muscles tightening and the sense of heat. Whereas a, uh, an experienced teacher will see something, they'll, you know, they'll feel that slight tent tightening in the stomach, but they'll immediately say, oh, okay, yeah, this is a very familiar sensation. I know how to deal with it. I can take a quick breath. I can just deal with it as we go. Now, here's the bit where I want to challenge, because if we say, well, that's an expert teacher, people often say, oh, well, a novice teacher who's only just started teaching doesn't have these things. But I'm going to be maybe a bit controversial because I think they do have these things. So let's imagine a beginning teacher that it is their first couple of weeks in the classroom. Um, so first of all, what do they have? Well, they have extensive schema of classrooms. That beginning teacher has spent probably 13, 14 years in a classroom. They have huge extensive experience of hundreds of classrooms, thousands of hours of being in a classroom. Uh, they know loads of things that happen in classrooms. They know the expectations of how things should be, what should happen, how teachers act, how students react because they have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in classrooms. So they have enormously well-developed schema of classrooms, but just not necessarily from the perspective of a teacher, but from the perspective of a student. They have really clear expectations of how teachers behave. They absolutely, again, made thousands of hours of observations of when students do this, teachers do this, when teachers do this, students do that. They have a sense of expectation of how things should happen. Um, and even though they might not necessarily be able to carry those procedures out themselves, they have absolute sense of certain things follow other things. Um, they have real sense of how to be in a classroom. A student will again have thousands of hours of hard fought experience in what it means to sit in the classroom, to be in the classroom with other people, uh, what their actions should be if called upon to do things. They have very high levels of automaticity. A student doesn't need to think about, um, I can getting, you know, the, uh, the teacher is asking a question, what do I do? They even, they anticipate that the teacher has finished a question, they might immediately activate all the muscles to put their hand in the air while they're continuing to finish that perfect answer and rehearse it in their head so that they're ready or they might see a bit of disruption over there and they immediately go into kind of don't get involved behavior. They might have really automatic habits for like, look down, don't get involved, or maybe, oh yeah, sort of cheer and really focus. Um, really high levels of automatic behavior that they've uh, accumulated over a long time. Um, that perception of what's going on in the classroom, they're really focused on how fellow students are behaving in terms of behavior. Uh, probably not about the learning, but they're really focused on certain things that affect them as students. Um, and also they know what makes them feel anxious in the classroom or what makes them feel happy in the classroom. And all of these massive expertly built experiences of being a student in the classroom are brought for that beginning teacher for that part of their uh, as they begin. And yet, we often say, oh, these are complete novices. They don't know anything about teaching or classrooms. So, you know, you have to teach them as though they're real novices and you just lay things out, A, B, C, D, E. And maybe we use, for example, instructional coaching and give them really small snippets. Now that's a bit of a problem because that's not really the reality, is it? Um, and in fact, in some areas, they are a cognitive expert 
term expert is really problematic because expert in the normal English language means, you know, they're really good at something. In cognitive terms, expert means they've got really developmental uh, schema and habits and so on. And um, so we often run into this problem that when we say a cognitive expert doesn't necessarily mean they're actually good at the task they're doing. It just means they've got very developed mental thinking. So in some ways, the beginning teacher has loads of expertise and some of it is the wrong type of expertise. Teachers shouldn't be behaving as though they're a student and they shouldn't be behaving. Um, they shouldn't be focusing on the things that students focus on. They need to focus on other things. And so in some cases, we've got a case of expert expertise that needs kind of deconstructing and reconstructing in a different way. Um, but in some aspects, uh, beginning teachers are genuinely novice. I mean, basically, students have no idea how teachers plan lessons and they have no real idea of like what really goes on when you're sat at the front and what you're doing and how you're monitoring. Like They don't have habits for that. They don't really have habits of, um, you know, how you approach the classroom, how you set it up, how you plan and grab the materials, how you reflect afterwards, how you plan things. So there are some areas where genuinely like there are no established habits, there's no established knowledge going on there. And in those cases, yes, we have some genuine novices. Um, and that's one of the reasons why when you say to a beginning teacher, you need to plan a lesson, they go, oh my goodness, I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea how to plan this. It's like completely overwhelmed. But if you say, um, oh, quick, you just need to be a teacher in that classroom. And even though they might say, oh, no, I feel really anxious about it. They've got loads of established sense of what a teacher should look like in that classroom. OK, everyone, get on, do this, do this, do this. But all they'll have is the sense of what the teacher looked like to them. So the really interesting thing is um, actually getting teachers to move from what they were like as a student and what they saw as a student to what you want them to be now can be very difficult. Um, and what sometimes happens with us as teachers is we re-explain what we're doing to ourselves. We come up with really good explanations of why things are different and how we've changed. But there are a number of studies that show that actually, if you look at how teachers um, think they've changed and can explain what they're doing versus how much their practice has actually changed, then there's a real mismatch between the two. Um, Susan, if you just want to put your, um, I, I don't know if you raised your hand by accident or not, but if you just want to put your message in the chat, then I can see what you said there. Um, so uh, yeah, this idea that they've got these mental models um, and they change the mental models and they assume their practice has changed as a result, but actually it hasn't, but they just feel more satisfied because they can now explain what's happening. Um, and the, the next thing is, uh, there was this lovely study um, from 1974, okay, thanks Susan, no problem. Um, a study from 1974 where they actually found that if you ask teachers, okay, tell me what you're gonna change in your practice, and then you look at what they change, um, then actually the two aren't correlated. And in fact, if you then feed back and say, oh no, no, you didn't, um, either you overestimate how much they change or you underestimate how much they change, they go, oh, okay, fine, I'll correct it now. And they still don't correct it. So our intentions to change, don't always change what we actually do. They sometimes change the way we explain what we do. And often um, uh, we find we actually go back to whatever our teachers did. And the problem with that is as soon as things become habitual as a teacher, so as soon as you think this is how, well, this is what happens in the classroom, then uh, it's very hard to change. So these two statements are quite important. If you don't have habits ingrained, then you can make an intention and you can make things change quite easily. But if you have habits already, then that massively suppresses the amount to which you can change your habits. Um, perhaps not surprising, essentially habits resist change. Um, and interestingly, the more stressed you are, the harder it is to change habits. And this was a point made by uh, Mike Hobbes, Sam Sims and Becky Allen in their recent paper um, about teacher habits. And they pointed out that actually we put teachers in high stress situations. And what high stress situations do is they turn um, whatever we're doing now more rapidly into habits. If you're under more stress, you form habits more quickly and they're harder to change. If you relax and you're under less stress, it's easy to change the habits, which of course means that if you're in a stressful job like teaching, you really quickly form habits and then they become sort of solidified in. So that's tough. So we've got this problem that we start off with teachers whose most of their perception of what it means to be a teacher is what I what they saw their teachers do. 
And then, of course, they do pick up other ideas, but they think they're changing more than they are. And um, a lot of the things which they still um, default to, particularly under pressure, is whatever they experienced as a student. It's very hard to remove those experiences. So changing pedagogy, it's pretty tough. Um, we can see it might be very different in the way we plan lessons, because planning lessons, there aren't going to be all these existing schema. But of course, if we start putting uh, new teachers under massive pressure, they'll rapidly form whatever habits, even potentially bad habits, and then it'll be very hard for them to change. Now, it's worth revisiting the literature about what we do know about expert teachers in terms of what's different um, about expert teachers versus uh, non-expert teachers. And um, one of the ones which I think is particularly fascinating here is that is this whole thing that uh, expert teachers, they see a classroom very differently. And it's a fascinating thing if you get a novice teacher or if you get a new, uh, someone who's not really been a teacher before versus uh, an experienced teacher to observe a lesson and then write down what they think happened, they'll notice very different things. Um, the reason they do that is of course, experts have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours worth of experiences in the classroom from the experience of a teacher. And so, they will focus on the things that make a difference as a teacher. Whereas if you're new to teaching, you'll probably focus on the things that make most different to you as a student, as in someone misbehaved, and then maybe what the teacher said. Whereas an experienced teacher moves away from those ideas and focuses a lot more on the things that make more importance to the expert teacher, which are small student reactions and like little nuances of learning and indicators of learning. So experts are able to recognize more signs of learning quickly and they're able to predict learning more quickly. They see more information about what's going on in the classroom. They see it more rapidly. They quickly go to the more subtle and salient features. Um, uh, so subtle features as in not necessarily the biggest movements, but salient about learning. What's, what are the indicators of learning? Um, experts have a stronger sense of actually this isn't as good as it should be. They have a sense of what should be and they can notice where it isn't as it should be. Whereas a novice just kind of sees things as they are because they don't really have so many mental models of what it should be apart from as a student view. Um, experts can more rapidly notice smaller interactions rather than how the whole class is behaving. Um, and experts can be more aware of the variation of what's going on in the classroom because they have so many mental models, they can see the differences between what should be happening and what they're used to happening and what is happening. Um, so therefore they can anticipate and predict what's coming. Um, expert teachers tend to jump in and deal with problems more quickly because they see them coming at an earlier stage. Um, they focus, as I said, more on learning and less on who is behaving well and who isn't. And you can see the conformance with behavioral norms is really important as a student. I need to know who's behaving and who's not. It's kind of important for my survival as a student. Whereas for the teacher, actually, they now need to now, now need to focus on other things. Um, this is interesting. So when you ask, if you sort of stop a lesson in a video and you ask a, an experienced teacher to tell you what happened, they'll usually say, oh, right at the beginning, I saw this and then it turned into that. And then later on, they did this and then this because they've picked out the changes over time, whereas uh, uh, a less experienced teacher just kind of tells you what's happening right now. And in fact, ex expert teachers will often explain what's happening in this lesson based on several previous lessons. They've connected it together much more uh, well, expertly. Um, and then this idea of interoception again, um, expert teachers are less surprised by how they feel in lessons. Uh, they can self-regulate themselves better. Um, acting differently, uh, expert teachers are much more flexible in what they do. Um, they're much less likely to just follow a series of uh, explanations or activities. Um, and if you're an expert teacher or an experienced teacher and you've watched a new teacher, you sometimes find it really frustrating that they just drag on too slow during some bits or they speed up really quickly when people clearly haven't got it. They're not being adaptive. As an expert, you want to adapt to respond to what's happening um, and be flexible, whereas the novice teacher doesn't do that. They sort of just crash on regardless. Um, but also expert teachers, because they're more aware of what could go wrong, then they are constantly questioning. They're constantly questioning and checking if um, the understanding is happening and they're anticipating future problems. So they question are all around the topic as they go. Um, they make more links to the whole arc of the topic, not only learning it this time, but the previous time we learned it and then anticipating the next time we learn it. Um, and also they're a lot more efficient. So um, 
you often find expert teachers really quickly get to the nub of the explanation and then they focus on that and then they really quickly go on to the next task whereas a novice teacher has a lot more sort of procedural stuff that they can get stuck on um talked about anticipating and responding they act earlier um and of course this means that novices are focused on the big behavior thing that's just happened whereas experts focus on the small signs that something might be going wrong, they headed off earlier and therefore it never happens. But of course the novice teacher will watch that and say, I have no idea what just happened. They just, I vaguely saw them move over there and they'll think, but I can't see what they did to make the behavior good. Um, and then uh, the experts will, having seen and perceived so much more and having so much stronger sense of the patterns of what happens in classrooms, then and also knowing the history of how things happened and what is likely to happen in the future, they can essentially be much more flexible based on much more complex information of what's going on. So just everything about them is a lot more uh, professionally adaptive and responsive. Um, we said they plan differently and, and experts are going to um, be much less comfortable just planning a one-off lesson. So it's very interesting if you ask experienced teachers say to do an interview lesson then um, they're often quite grumpy because they say but I need to know like what did they learn before and what happened before and so on and they end up kind of just doing oh I guess you want to see this whereas a novice is a lot happier with just planning a, a single lesson um, planning is quicker we all know that you all know you can go through your lesson as an experienced teacher and just say right I'm doing that topic and that and that and that and actually in some cases you just need to write two words and you immediately know what it is you want to achieve in that lesson and it automatically unlocks the rest of the knowledge for you. If you do plan something specific, it might be around a really key misconception, a really key idea, a key activity, a slight tweak. Um, so it enables you to be massively more efficient in planning, much more focused on key things. Um, Christina, I'll just come to your question in just a second. Um, oh, and Donna as well. Um, and so planning is focused on the bigger picture. You tend to focus on, ski on uh, all of how the whole year is progressing, how that subject is progressing, rather than what this lesson looks like, um, and be more flexible and focus more on differentiation. And then finally, I oh know, in fact, before we get on to thinking differently, right, two questions. Um, Christina said, uh, do you think we can teach novice teachers to spot these things in lesson, or is it a case of it will come with experience? Um, no, I think we can, um, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but I think uh, one of the things which is very powerful is having expert teachers narrate what they're seeing in the classroom. Um, there's a very common activity, which is plan a lesson together. Maybe the mentor teaches it first, they reflect on it together, and then maybe the, uh, the mentee or the new teacher teaches it. And that's a really important direction of travel because you need to uh, plan it together. And then the mentor needs to say, I'm gonna do that because I'm expecting this to happen. Then I'm gonna do one of these two things because this or this or this could happen. So when you're watching, look out for these things. Ideally, you record the lesson together, you watch it back, and then um, as the mentor is watching with the mentee, they can point out key things that are happening. Do you see there? Do you see the way I moved over there? Let's go back a minute. Do you see the way they were just beginning to fiddle? That looked a bit different. Therefore, I went over, right? So you begin to narrate what's happening and help them see with the expert's eyes. Not that they'll immediately form the schema for that, but they'll be attracted to the key features that are important, which means their learning will be faster. Um, Donna asks, do you think the restrictions of teaching in socially distanced classrooms has mitigated the expertise of experienced teachers? Absolutely. So we've seen loads of situations where expert teachers, very, very comfortable, automatic, have become much more procedural. I just have to follow this because I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with the tech. And they really struggled. We've seen expertise reversal. As I'll come on to in a minute, that can be helpful because actually some teachers have taught basically the same way for you know, 10, 15, 20 years not because they're doing anything wrong, just because, you know, they can sometimes shift their mental models, but the actual practice doesn't change. Whereas, and the only way to really shift what's going on is we need to disrupt our thinking and nothing has disrupted our thinking more than being forced to teach online um, in a completely different way. So I have no doubt that that will have really shifted the perspectives of very expert teachers to think again as novices, but that will have also shifted them out of some of their thinking patterns and into thinking in new ways. Um, let's carry on. Um, so anyway, those were that right. Ooh, I, I answered it. I answered it live. No, I don't know how to. Anyway, let's make that one go away. Dismiss. Um, expert teachers uh, think differently. So um, we, we, we reflected on this idea that um, experts are more likely to remember and prioritise the amount of learning in a lesson. 
So if I'm thinking back to a lesson, I'll be more likely to focus on what was learned and indications of that rather than did they behave and did I cover stuff? And that goes back actually to um, Professor Sam Twizzleton's research where she looked at um, the different stages of students as they go from uh, early beginning teachers to very experienced teachers. And initially it's very much on, I will say, and then eventually I will cover. And then it only eventually, it only finally, it sort of moves on to what they'll learn. Um, so interestingly, we then get into some problems with expert teachers. So novice teachers blame themselves far too much. They say, oh, they didn't learn, it was my fault. And uh, expert teachers um, uh, tend to focus on more fixed issues. So one of the ways we develop kind of resilience in the classroom is not blaming ourselves for everything all the time. But the problem with that is uh, expert teachers begun, begin to get more fixed. Now, of course, this might not feel like you, that's fine. On average, across teachers, when you look at these studies, you find that they expert teachers begin to make more external attributions. That means they're saying, well, actually, they didn't learn because they, they didn't learn because, you know, their parents or their attitude or their effort or their ability. Um, whereas novice teachers are much more saying they didn't learn because I, um, which of course is harder on yourself. Um, and of course, the reality is somewhere between the two, isn't there? Because everyone has a contribution to learning. Um, so these attributions are very important. Um, so if I'm a teacher, then the way I attribute the cause of things really makes a big difference to me. So if, if it was, if I think I was the cause, then I might blame myself. If I think it was the student or their family, for example, oh, they come from a bad family, then I sort of excuse myself and I may, may then stop making more effort. Um, if I say they didn't do well, then do I think that is a fixed thing? They didn't do well and they'll never do well. Or do I think they will didn't do well, but uh, they could do well? So it depends whether it's fixed or malleable, or some people might say stable or unstable. And that attribution is very important. If I decide a pupil is not very bright or they do not do very well, then if I can change that to they did not do very well yet or they did not do very well in this particular instance, but that could change, that completely changes my attitude to my efforts in that student because I can persuade them to say, well, if you do this, you could. If I do this, then you could. Um, so that's really important. Um, and then there's this sense about the agency. So it might be I say, well, yeah, I mean, they didn't do very well. They could do really well, but there's nothing I can do. Someone else would have to fix it. So the other really important thing is the agency that we tend to have as teachers. Um, so I think that's really important that we're exploring why we think things are going to happen, who is responsible, who are all the different people responsible are. Um, if it didn't happen, will it never happen or could it happen in future? Um, and then, of course, we need to check that what people say they believe is really what they believe. That's quite can be quite difficult. Um, so interestingly, what often happens is when uh, we see students' academic performance, um, then we tend to, particularly as we become more expert, assume that their academic performance is a function of some of their internal stable capacities. So if you've done well, that's because the effort, you're, you're quite smart and uh, it will always be so. You will always be a smart person. And if I think you do well and you did do well, I'd go, yeah, of course, because you're a smart person. Um, you know, you're, you've got high ability or you always put loads of effort in or, you know, you're a real, a real enthusiastic engager. But if you don't do as well as I thought or you did much better than I thought, then I'm much more likely as a teacher to say, oh, well, actually, that was kind of a one-off thing. So um, it might be, oh, well, maybe just, you know, either the lesson didn't work for you or you were just lucky or, oh, you put in a bit of extra effort that day. Um, so the interesting thing is that, and this is, can be a problem, we've got to police in ourselves. <laughs> we've got to check with ourselves, but also we need to check with others is um, we've got to see if we can not just allow ourselves credit for successes and blame the students for failure. And again, not everybody does this, of course, but it happens on average more and more as we get more experienced. We just need to be careful of that. Um, and then the other thing is, if a high ability student does well, we, feel we tend to feel proud. We tend to feel guilty if a high ability student in our, in our thinking uh, does badly. Uh, if we consider a student low ability and they do well, we go, oh, how exciting. And of course, they'll see the, the surprise and shock in our faces. Whereas um, we'll go, oh, if uh, it, someone we consider low ability doesn't do well. Um, 
And again, they'll see rather than, oh, you could do a loads better. I've gone, oh, you poor thing. And something about that will let them read in our faces that we kind of thought they wouldn't have done well anyway. Um, and there's this self-fulfilling prophecy. This is a real problem in teaching that our expectations of our students and in fact each other become self-fulfilling prophecies. And this can happen teacher to teacher. If I'm, if I'm your coach and you do badly and I go, oh, poor thing. Oh yeah, that's really difficult, isn't it? And it doesn't really sound like I think you could do loads better. Whereas if I say, no, I mean, that really wasn't anywhere near as good as it could be, really, was it? And I sound quite frustrated and cross with you. Everything is communicating the fact that I think you did really well, right? I mean, if I go, wow, that was really good, um, then it does sound a bit like I'm surprised that it was really good. So, you know, again, these attributions act, um, really are communicated in the way we talk to each other. Um, and all this actually affects morale. Um, interestingly, if you get teachers who say, um, my students don't behave uh, because either the class is not behaving very well or actually I didn't use the right strategies, then I'm much more likely to say I'm going to get better. So if we make sure if we check on teachers attributions, um, that can be really important. Um, interestingly, if uh, teachers believe that there's more aspects of success within their control, then they're less likely to burn out. Because if you say to someone, you have to get them to do better, but you think I have no control over getting them to do better, that's gonna lead to this massive problem between what we want teachers to do and what they can actually achieve. So that's a huge problem for burnout actually and wellbeing when people are asked to do things they don't feel they have control over. Um, and then interestingly, if I do get stressed as a teacher, if I think the cause of that is a temporary malleable thing that could be changed, I'm less likely to burn out because I think, well, someone can fix it. Um, and then I'll feel better when it does get fixed. So <clears throat> what do we do? Well, to help teachers improve, we do need to develop more expert thinking and patterns. So we need to get expert teachers to narrate the process of thinking, what they're seeing, how they're planning, work with other teachers to develop those thinking patterns and make very explicit how that's happening um and develop wider understanding of what's going on in classrooms so that's looking at say exercise books together and saying what are we seeing here well i'm seeing this and i was interested how a few pages before they've done this and then this and then maybe linking what they see in exercise books to recordings of videos and just getting the experts to show how all of these things are interconnected and modeling it for less experienced teachers um and then showing how a strategy you know you might pick a, a lemov teach like a champion strategy and then maybe model how that might be used in different ways. And maybe, well, I'll do this and I'll do this. Or I started doing this, then I stopped and changed because. Um, so obviously you need to begin by getting someone to understand the technique, but then you need to get the perception behind it um, as well. And I think that's the thing we often don't do so well in teacher education. I think we focus very much on do this and do it this way and less on how to make it adaptable, what the perception is, what should be happening when you see it and what were the signs it's not working and when might you want to change it and so on. Um, and also helping people plan. I don't think we do any favours by providing these massively scripted curricula where every lesson is planned in a box because that stops people from planning the whole series. And, and when I think back to my experience back in the early 2000s of training with a national curriculum, I kind of trained a lesson at a time. I didn't really get the grand sweep of the scheme because it didn't encourage me to, it didn't, and it didn't really explain how each lesson in those old national curriculum schemes actually fit within the arc. It didn't fit, show how each thing built on each other. It, it was much more one off. And so that wasn't helpful as a beginning teacher. Um, it's important that when teachers finish lessons and maybe we've observed them, we try to get them away from, they behaved, I didn't feel good, I felt stressed, etc., and actually focus on the learning that happened. And really good professional learning <clears throat> does, excuse me, gently losing my voice, <clears throat> does get teachers to really focus on the key learning moments and actually what were the moments where we could have seen signals that things weren't working well? What were the misconceptions? How does that relate to what we thought would happen? Um, but also we need to specifically tackle some of these issues around attributions. You know, what did you think was going to happen here? Um, did it happen? Why do you think it happened? Is that is it possible to change that? Who could change that? It, could you change it? Um, could someone else change it? Um, how, to what extent do you think the student is 
could do better. Um, and we need to find really safe, open environments where we can, teachers can articulate things that we might go, oh no, that's a terrible expectation and not make them feel judged for saying it because people have to be able to articulate with honesty what they really think now if we're gonna change it. Um, now the challenge is improvement isn't linear. So um, expertise that you develop really depends on a number of things. Number one, you get better if you stick with the same material. So if you stick with say the same textbook or scheme or the same topics um, to similar year groups, um, you're much more likely to accumulate wisdom. If you teach similar students, if you're always teaching um, in year seven maths to what you might call uh, quotes, low ability sets or the bottom sets, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, we could go into why later. Um, you will become more expert with teaching those sorts of children or children with some similarities to that. Um, pedagogies. This is one we all had a problem with recently. We're suddenly switching to online teaching. If my pedagogy is I teach this way in the classroom like this, you get pretty expert at using that. But if everyone suddenly says, oh, now you have to use a three part lesson or everyone has to do a, a retrieval starter or everyone has to teach online through teams. Well, that's a problem because suddenly that reduces the expertise. Um, and interestingly, when you get a really expert teacher in one topic in one school in one set of students, and you ask them to go in a different school or a different topic or a different set of students, you see their expertise goes down. Alison said, do you think some of the aspects of expert teaching you mentioned uh, commonly differ depending on subject? So a non-practical teacher spotting differences and attributions in a practical lessons. Yeah, completely, absolutely. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I spent uh, 10 years as a physics and maths teacher. If you ask me to watch a PE lesson, I'm only going to pick out surface features of the PE lesson because the pedagogy is so different, the classroom is so different, the environment is so different, I couldn't possibly notice the small nuances within that. And actually what I'll probably do is go back to what it felt as a student in a PE classroom, <laughs> a PE on the field, in the, in the hall, whatever, and I'll probably focus on some of those features. And that's one of the reasons why same subject observation is really important because to get the real depth of, oh, actually that's a tiny misconception in the way they uh, reflected on that essay is really important, but might not stand out to me as a maths teacher or physics teacher. So yeah, it's really important. It's not impossible for someone to observe somebody else, but of course they will be drawn to the more generic aspects of teaching and or elements that they might have felt strongly about as students. Um, we just have to, you know, understand that. Um, does that have an implication for the quality of feedback, asks Christina, that you like to get from an SLT who teach a very different subject to you? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why the Ofsted inspector who thought they could go around and judge a good lesson or not. Um, no, no, you just, you know what you like. Um, you know, it's why the, uh, that sense of, uh, you know, some chief inspectors who've claimed, oh, everyone knows what a good lesson is. Well, you might know what a good lesson is in a very generic way, but that might not be specific to the pedagogy of that subject. And that becomes a problem if they then want consistency across different classrooms where the underlying conceptual consistency might be good, but superficial consistency on surface features that they happen to spot, that's not necessarily a good idea. Um, now, this is a really lovely little study. So um, this is from David Lazar's uh, 2015 study. So what he showed, first of all, is this is what happens. Uh, so on the left hand side, this was uh, American teachers in primary mathematics or math, as they say and how over the years you could see that their results in mathematics were improving. Um, and on the right hand side, it's English language arts, which is broadly, let's call it language in English. Now, what I'm now going to add on to that is a line from the teachers who switched year group or switched grade, as they would say in the US. So you can see, let's take the one on the right hand side, first of all, um, we can see over here that the teachers who after five years uh, switched to a different grade, and in that case it would be, have to be at least two years difference in order to view the study, they became a lot less effective at improving test scores than the ones who'd stayed in the same grade. Or here there were several, so if the person changed after year four to a different grade, instead of going up to this test score on average, they went down to this test score on average. Same, you can basically see the lines of the grade switches were lower than the gradients of the people who stayed in the same grade. And then, in fact, there was one more who, having switched grade, they then started getting more effective again afterwards. So basically, you can see this is a really elegant little study that shows if you start switching 
the year group that you teach at and the topics you teach, then you get less effective. Emily says, um, do you think new teachers should spend more time supporting in the classroom before being left alone with their own classes? Um, well, potentially, but only if someone is actually narrating what's happening and what's being said and thought. So they need to be in planning of lessons together. They need to really be thinking of what they're seeing. They still need to experience what it's like from the front of the room. And they still need to be reflecting on what was intended to happen versus what did happen. Um, and people helping unpick that thinking. And then also potentially be have the opportunity to practice small little segments of the lesson, you know, also the things that cause anxiety, getting everybody in, getting them quiet, those sorts of things, get those out of the way. And actually, yes, then more time observing could be helpful, but only, you know, only with a lot of expert input, I would have thought. Um, uh, Louise said, can teachers be experts in certain aspects of pedagogy? Um, yeah, absolutely. And again, we've got this problem of cognitive expert, as in I have lots of interconnected thinking and thoughts versus a professional expert who is actually very good at something. So we've got the two different English definitions of expert, which are really causing us problems here. So can you be good in certain aspects of pedagogy and not others? Yes, absolutely. It might be that you are cognitively expert in both the good bits and the bad bits. So you might have developed a whole bunch of just terrible habits in questioning, but you might have a whole bunch of really automatic and really great habits in metacognition, for example. Um, so which just means that when if you've become expert, if you've become cognitively expert in doing a bad thing, it just makes it harder to unpick, right? Um, more of a coaching model to teacher training, potentially. Yeah, I agree, Emily. I think that's um, that could be one of the ways forward. Louise says, how do you think this translates to secondary teachers teaching multiple year groups daily? Well, it's a problem, isn't it? Um, because you, you get to switch a lot. Um, so you, I suppose you get to generalize features of learning more quickly. Um, but it is a problem when you, you know, you're doing year seven statistics one day and then you're doing a level, uh, a level quadratics, not, oh my goodness, I've forgotten everything you do at A level. Anyway, you're doing A level mathematics the following day and trying to generalize those key features of what you're doing pedagogy is very hard and you get kind of chucked in. And again, really good mentoring and coaching might be able to help you pick out the key features of the pedagogy that exist in both. That's why, you know, whole school CPD that is focused on things like Rosenstein's principles, where you're really focused on what you're doing in each of those cases is great. But Rosenstein is again, often focused on what we do rather than what we perceive. And what's missing in Rosenshine and TLAC, et cetera, is what we see and how we plan sometimes. Um, so carrying on for a second, um, CPD is more likely to work then um, has got to be less focused on standardized and flexible routines and scripts, um, which is not to say you can't do it initially. I really do not have a problem with teaching like a champion as long as it is. Look, here is a tool. Um, let's, you know, let's teach you to hit the nail with the hammer really well. But then, by the way, at some point, we need to learn about different walls and we need to learn about different size screws and we need to learn about different things where you'll have to use loads of more complicated things afterwards. Um, but at some point, you actually need to know how to use the hammer, right? So TLAC, I think, gives you some really good basics. But as long as we realise it doesn't teach you how to perceive when it's useful to vary it and when you need to use it and that sort of thing. So we need to add more onto it. And as soon as teachers start getting more, um, more expert, we do need to focus a bit less on the standardised stuff. Um, more focus on insights and flexible classroom strategies, I think, is important again helping people reflect on their lessons. What did you see? What did a really great teacher see? Um, that's one of the reasons why if when I play the imaginary game of I'm pretending to have just been appointed head teacher, the first thing I would want to do in a school is get access to just some absolutely fantastic teachers in all of those subject areas and get them to coach and work with my existing teachers, not by telling them they're not good, but by reflecting together on what they're seeing and what really great expectations could look like. And by the way, come to my lesson and see how much they can do in that lesson. Let's explore why and so on. Um, I think that's really important. Um, so use those experienced practitioners. Um, I really wish we could have a lot more videos of really great practitioners having their thinking picked apart by really great coaches, recording their thinking about how they planned and how they taught and what they noticed and how they reflected and how they followed it up. I think that would be fantastic. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think Dylan Williams work on formative assessment, his um, uh, teacher learning communities work is actually, it's really effective 
and it's been you know shown in the randomized control trial to be a good form of professional learning because it helps teachers focus on the impact they're having on pupils it helps them think about ways to tweak their practice it helps them do it responsively because you have to be responsive it helps them think about how individual teachers res uh, pupils responded and it gives them really high quality strategies that have been modeled and carefully thought through so you know i think that can be really helpful but uh, you know it's not the only way of doing it um now we've been reflecting quite a lot as a charity say it's all very well but under what conditions do the, does this learning happen and under what conditions does it not happen and uh, in fact uh, last week uh, we shared our new uh, working paper. So it is a working paper. We are still working on it, literally, but we thought we'd share where we're at at the minute. So myself and Bethan Hindley and Murray Cunningham uh, published this document. Uh, no, we didn't publish it. We shared it. We haven't peer reviewed it yet. Um, first of all, very clear across lots of literature that teachers working conditions have a clear, consistent relationship with student achievement. Um, that's really interesting. There is a very strong association between schools where teachers report more positive things about their working conditions and where students are in, outcomes are improving. Um, and it's very clear that leaders have a really important role in this. So we've, not that these are necessarily the only five things, but five things that stand out quite consistently across the literature in this area are that in schools where teachers are getting better, teachers have more times to plan lessons together, review lessons together, review curriculum together, review data together, plan and moderate assessments. And from what I've just said, you can see why, because people are articulating expert thinking, they're digging into the impact they're having, they're thinking about planning more flexibly, they're reflecting, they're adapting. Um, another thing that makes a difference in the conditions is when teachers feel more involved in whole school planning and decision making. If you feel more involved in decision making, you feel more sense of agency, you feel more listened to and trusted your stress levels are likely to be lower and therefore you're more able to shift your habits and you're less likely to automate, to automate bad habits. Um, same with through this one, in a culture of trust and respect and lots of open uh, communication, stress levels lower, communication is easier, you can get honest feedback and, you're, and you can learn much better. Um, if you have a shared mission, that means you're building your sense of what is possible and, ex and uh, expectable that's not a right word, I can't think of the correct one. Um, and uh, what the professional behaviours you would expect are of each other and what you'd expect in student learning. And this last one goes back to trust and safety again, because in classrooms where teachers report they're constantly worried about low level disruption and bullying and stress, then they don't learn. And the reason they don't learn is stress stops the, uh, impedes the learning when you have uh, habitual behaviour. And if you don't yet have habitual, uh, habitual behavior, then you'll more rapidly just adopt whatever you have now and use that and that will become uh, your habits. Again, goes back to the Hobbes, uh, Sims and Allen paper. Um, so we also need to allocate teachers to the right partners. Um, it's fairly clear that where teachers work closely alongside someone who is more effective than them, then they get better. And again, that's pretty obvious from what we've just discussed, professional conversations that elicit expert thinking. Um, so that has an impact uh, uh, upon uh, student attainment. Um, similarly, if we can keep teachers in the same classrooms or rather the same subject areas with similar students for longer, it doesn't necessarily mean they always have to be the same. And at secondary, it's not that you're always going to teach the same topics and things every single year. But if we can keep some of them the same, that's better before we then you know shift a few things each year. Um, and interestingly, all these working conditions seem to help school turnaround, as in, you know, dysfunctional school becomes more functional when these working conditions are there. Um, teachers want to stay in the profession and indeed the school, and uh, people seem to navigate COVID better, which seems very important. Um, and you can see it on the classic Kraft and Pape graph uh, is this. Um, so this was one of the uh, 13 studies that we use to look at in the paper, but it's the one with the nicest and prettiest graph. So um, you can see that actually you can see this teachers get better quite quickly, habits start forming, and then they kind of get, you know, really baked in here. But in the high quality environments where people work very closely together and they're articulating thinking and the stress and is lower and the trust is higher, then they can start changing those habits on average. But in higher stress, lower trust, poorer partnering schools, then nothing really changes over time. Um, so why is the plateau happening? Well, I think attributions, 
jaded teachers, experienced teachers starting to say, well, look, I'm doing what's good enough and I can't change anything anyway. And the students are never going to get better. And your expectations of what's possible limit your efforts to help students do better because you think, well, they can't really do much better than this and it's good enough. Um, you, you see classrooms in the same way, you start making the same judgments of what's happening, you're not learning, you're under stress, so you're not really learning so much anyway. Um, your habits get harder to shift. And over time, you know, experienced teachers just are, everything crystallizes, our learning crystallizes and it's harder to shift it, which means it's actually more important we work harder to create these environments where we can unstick these sort of stuck things. Um, so I think, you know, we need to avoid planning errors like um, overlooking the expertise of professional learners. And that means don't overlook the expertise of novice teachers. Uh, we mustn't um, think that new teachers don't know anything about classrooms. And actually, sometimes we need to say, well, what do you think is going to happen and what actually happened and get them to make that hidden thinking visible so we can actually say ah, oh, I think that's what you thought as a student now we need to think about what's hap really happening a uh, use of video I think is really useful um, as I said treating new teachers as classroom novices is a problem um, you can't assume that if you're a great teacher at one thing you're a great teacher in something else it doesn't necessarily transfer it doesn't mean none of it does but um, you know sometimes we've just got to be a bit careful um, we really need to stop saying good teaching is about doing these eight things, whether it's all of the Rosenshine principles or all of the things on the early career framework or doing teach like a champion. That's a tiny part of expertise. And you only become expert when you can use it flexibly with perception, with questioning, with insight, uh, with strategy, with good planning. So we need to focus on the whole teacher, if you like, rather than just um, teacher as a doer. So don't overscript and overpackage. You're actually allowed to do that. I think it's okay for a really new teacher who's overwhelmed and say, just do this, and it'll probably make it better, but then you need to rapidly get them further than that. Um, if we only ever focus on generic theory, and I do see that quite a lot on, great, we're going to teach someone about SEND and give them a few specific theories about SEND, or here's how to do good questioning. Um, it's no good unless people are actually generating the insights that help them use that questioning and help them adapt it to their students in their classrooms and uh, work out how to use it flexibly. So I need to take a sip. Um, and so, yeah, we've got to be really careful about kind of just saying, you now understand key features of a theory. Um, and what might happen is people change their mental models and think they've got better as a teacher, whereas they actually haven't. And I do think, um, I do think that's a particular issue on Twitter, actually. Uh, where I think many of us, I certainly did this, started persuading myself I'm a much better teacher because I have much more interesting mental models. Did my teaching really change that much? I'm not really sure. Um, and in fact, I remember, I remember one student uh, sort of as I started using a fantastic new technique of which I knew all the theory saying, oh, it's one of your Twitter ideas, isn't it, sir? And uh, which is very scathing, but true. And I, you know, I thought I was brilliant, but probably wasn't because uh, I didn't have a coach um, or I didn't really have much good CPD going on in that school. Um, but also, yeah, we can't neglect teacher sense of agency. If we don't have control and some sense of agency and control in our own learning, we won't think we can get better. Um, but we also shouldn't just put teachers together and say, yeah, you can probably figure out why you're not doing as well as you should. You probably can figure out the strategies to use. We need great expertise that develops the insights, perception, strategies, planning, and all of those things to help teachers get to that level. So yeah, effective school CPD needs lots of dialogue, um, not just visible practice and test results. It needs structured engagement with research and not just, I'm telling you research says this. My very favorite example of that was sat at a round table with someone who was, um, they were head of education at uh, one of the early academy trusts. And this person turned around to me and said, well, I've seen that the Education Endowment Foundation toolkit, it was the Sutton Trust toolkit then, the Sutton Trust toolkit says feedback's the number one most effective thing. So I tell them, look, you just need to mark your bloody books. Um, that's not great. Don't do that. So research doesn't just say we need to explore and give people the insights from it and how to use it rather than just research says. And as we say, we've got to be careful that people feel smarter and then think they've changed their practice when they haven't. Um, so that needs enough constructive challenge to actually shift what's happening and not just you know get nothing moving so there we go um 
I thought we might do a quick survey, actually. Let's do a quick survey. Um, so I'm just going to, how do I share this? I'm going to share this. I'm going to put it in the chat. Uh, get my little survey. Um, where's my little survey? No, that's not my little survey. I'm going to get my little survey. I'm going to go to this and I'd like you to do it. And we're going to see how we feel about all of those, all of these key conditions. Um, there it is. There it is. Uh, all panelists and attendees. Great. So the link is in the chat. Um, if you click on that, then that will take you to, to the survey. And I would love you to, it'll probably take you about three minutes to fill that in. And then I'm going to show you the results live. And we're just going to reflect on what you think about those enabling conditions and developing new teachers. And then that also has yet more opportunities to uh, ask me questions. So I'm just going to shut up just for about two minutes while you start filling that in. And I shall be monitoring as the results come in, a bit like your revision. And then I'll come back and we'll share those if it's OK. I'm carefully monitoring the survey responses. I'm still waiting for the first person to hit submit. So I'll stay quiet just for a moment more. Two responses. It's all happening now, people. You're all answering. OK, so um, keep going. Keep pressing submit. We'll watch the answers coming in live. Um, so let me try and put that on that screen. Let's press that button. Let's do that. Um, OK, and now I'm going to make sure we can actually share that screen and see it properly. Uh, where is it? There it is. OK. Look at this. Results coming in live. It's like we're at the nerve center of the results. It's very exciting. Um, well, first of all, aren't there a lot of interestingly different roles around here? Well, we've got teaching school directors and senior leaders and um, we have trainers and we have senior leaders and middle leaders and directors and classroom teachers and hurrah. Um, next thing is lots of different schools. That's great. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, how effective is my school? Um, creating effective collaboration to explore student data, etc. General view is needs improvement. Uh, a few needs improvement. Most people saying it's OK. Um, reasonably negative still on involving teachers in whole school planning. One person said, yeah, a bit better. Um, much more on creating a culture of mutual trust. OK, it is generally a lot more on the right hand side there. That's more positive. It's very interesting, actually, because I did this earlier today with a, a group of um, another group of uh, people who had slightly more senior leaders in, and they were more positive. Uh, more positive here, that's what happened earlier as well. Shared sense of mission, people feel generally more positive. More classroom safety, people feel generally more positive. So that's good. Uh, what are the challenges here moving from novice to expert? Time for real collaboration, understanding of what expertise is, capacity and training, finding time to have really valuable coaching conversations. Yeah, time, time, time. Uh, having uh, sufficiently developed expert teachers, that is a real issue. We need to do better with that as a system. Um, behaviour, time, behaviour, time, having everybody on board. Uh, some questions. Oh, no, it's done a really stupid thing. Who cut your hair? Uh, I did. I cut my own hair. And I'm generally, so many people have asked me about this. I'm generally thinking of doing my own video on it. Well, then someone who actually knows about these things will have a go at me. Um, 
Oh, Google is doing a stupid thing, so I'll have to go back and have a look at them in just a second. Um, any other questions? Dawn said, given the drop in performance of teachers who changed grades, does that validate the decision of some HODs to pigeonhole teachers to specialise with uh, some children? Um, it could do, Dawn. That might be an issue. Um, and we can't pigeonhole teachers because we need to gradually expand teachers' view of um, what happens over time. Um, yeah, it's a challenging one. Anyway, there we go. I need to stop there because I've I've got to the end of my time. But um, uh, jobs are good and great questions. Really interesting thoughts, everybody. And um, uh, some, there was some quality Twitter action going on. I just nipped over onto Twitter. You have flooded my Twitter timeline. How's that? David, thank you so much for that. Yeah, no, Twitter's, um, Twitter's all over. I mean, I, I, I loved it, but I, yeah, it, it's brilliant. Um, questions have been asked throughout the presentation anyway. If anyone does have a, any, any final questions they want to ask David, um, please put them in, in the chat box um, for us. Um, David, I've got a question. Is that all right? Because I've got the floor and all, so I might as well uh, use it. Um, so one of them really is um, with regards to... Um, in our area, there are lots of perhaps individual academies, uh, individual local authority schools. And um, how how much would you rate school to school support thinking about uh, the halo effect? Um, and as well, do you think it's really important that if schools do bit start to build that collaboration, context has to be key? So, for example, we still have um, grammar schools in our area here. Mm. Do you think there can be effective collaboration between um, those, those, those different schools with different contexts and intakes? Um, or do you think we're perhaps better if you are an individual school to perhaps um, collaborate with, with, with a school with similar context? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, I mean, let's start with the grammar school to non-grammar school question. And actually, um, my lovely co-author, Bridget, and I um, had a long conversation about this because there was one point where we were both teaching in Watford and I was teaching in the, quote, grammar school that had a partially selective intake. And she was teaching at the quotes comprehensive that had was kind of more secondary modern just down the road and oddly at one point some of her a-level pupils came over to my school and i was ending up teaching them we didn't know each other then um because they were like oh we'll go to the grammar school for some teaching um what was really interesting was uh i had these sort of two groups of pupils in my classroom and some of them clearly had lower expectations of what they could do and I didn't quite understand what their expectations were and the attributions and they weren't used to the style of teaching and it just seemed like a completely foreign world and actually it didn't work necessarily really well because um, and if I'd gone to the other school and said oh well you just need to teach this way um, like an idiot then that wouldn't have helped either because actually I didn't know enough about what had been going on to those pupils over time and I didn't know about you know some of the challenges there so it's not that you can't necessarily help. I think the worst thing is for teachers from one school to say, oh, just do what I do and everything will be a lot better. Um, because there's a whole bunch of reasons why, um, A, those students have some really interesting attributions of like how, how well they think they can get, what their expectations are of what good looks like, whether they think people like them will do it, whether they think effort will make it happen, whether they think their teachers are able to make it happen, whether they think they'd be supported, whether they think people would react well to them massive load of issues that are all built into the cultural norms that need unpicking um teachers who frankly have probably been told quite a lot oh you've been doing it wrong here's another way you're doing it wrong just do it this way it's not a great way of getting teachers to move and shift so it's not that it's not possible but i just think we it might be that teachers from the grammar school may have some insights say into curriculum planning and some thinking and explanations that might be really helpful into the assessment for learning maybe there might be a few good questions but with a lot more tentatively and in terms of actually planning and practicing the lesson with different types of pupils well significantly less so their expertise will be much less and the problem is me with my partially selective expertise from that particular school I'd kind of revert to a bit more of a novice watching someone else and I'd only pick out the super feature, superficial features of the lesson or I'd be making the wrong judgments because I didn't understand what was going on. So that's the first problem. Peer-to-peer -peer support, school-to-school -school support generally, um, again, needs to happen not at a superficial level. So it can't just be, oh, your school's going to help mine. Um, and it can't be someone saying, oh, here's the theory of why we did it better, because that won't necessarily help. Sometimes it could be really useful for people in my school to go to the school up the road and try and say, well, they are kind of similar children, actually. And I can see what you're doing here, and it's different from what I'd normally see. And I come away with new mental models of what 
classrooms can look like and what's possible. And if I then work well at school up the road, maybe that can help me figure out, actually, that was quite exciting. I'd love to be able to do that. I feel more positive about what's possible. I've changed my own attributions. So it can be, but I think people just assume it was this crazy idea that school schools force is good school helps bad school, they just make it happen, boom. And it's just nowhere near that simple. It needs a lot more thought about how you get it from there to there. And it's the same way that like, you can't just hope a physicist works with a key stage three physics student and just hope that they can help each other. They might be thinking in very different ways and it needs the teacher who understands how the development happens and how the development's got there to unpick and translate. And I think the same is probably true. We need great coaches to say, don't just go to that school. You need to understand how they got there. I mean, in a sense, I suppose that's what we try and do as a charity. We try and help schools say, how did that school get really great at professional development? And we try and unpick exactly how they got there and what happened and the mistakes and what your learning should be at this stage in order to help you get there, right? That's kind of how we try and work as an organization. But I think it needs that. David, thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the questions, by the way. I'm not, <laughs> not as ignored. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got loads of questions. I could go all night. I just... <laughs> So, look, I, you know, looking at those ones, and I know um, mm. Nimish made the interesting point there about trusts. Yeah. And trusts have exactly that same challenge, actually, of loads of schools and loads of different situations. And actually what central teams need to do is actually create that environment in which different bits of thinking is unpicked and the core ingredients are shared and the insights are shared and the perception is shared and not just that works, that doesn't work, move that from there to there. At the same time, Sometimes, you know, we can overcomplicate things. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's like, look, that's just so dysfunctional. We could really start unpicking A, A B, C, D, E, and F. But actually, in this case, the better change circumstance might be, you just need to do it this way. And actually, initially, you might be quite unhappy with it. But as soon as you start seeing the results and saying, honestly, this is actually a lot better, that might be a better approach. Yeah. You know, it's not that we always have to just, oh, let me gently unpick and what are you thinking and how are you doing? And, mm -hmm. you know, that can be great in some circumstances. It doesn't have to be all of it. But ultimately, we need to get to a point where people feel in engaged and energized and capable and confident and however you get there. Right. But there are different different routes you could take. Um, I think that's why trusts find it so hard. You know, they're often like, here's my central offer and mm -hmm. here's how I'm helping schools. And LA's before them found exactly the same issue. So I don't know how we imagine that trust would magically make that better. Obviously, there are some different levers. Yeah. Um, um, any more questions? Anyone else want to ask anything else? Literally just talked everybody into a standstill. That's always good. David, I haven't got a question, but I just want to say that was fantastic. That was oh, brilliant. thank you very much. That, no, that was seriously good. Really. Hello, I think I'm just sort of sat here in awe, just yeah, taking it, was... it all in. <laughs> so it was, it was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for agreeing to be part of this. So. Absolute pleasure. And actually what was really fun is it allowed me to pull together a bunch of threads of stuff that I've been reading and writing stuff on recently. So that's been good. So I kind of dug out an old research ed talk and added bits and wove other pieces in. So I really enjoyed myself, I have to say. So <laughs> I really appreciate cool. everybody allowing me to just <laughs> stand and waffle for a bit and I've still got my bowl of now very lukewarm water trying to lubricate my larynx <laughs> <laughs> when um, when is your because you said it's a working paper when mm. are we likely to have that sort of published oh well so it's working paper as in everyone can download it um, and it gets you can get it from I'm just typing it in you can get it from there um, Perfect. So you can yeah. grab it you can download it if you are a research nerd who isn't a research nerd? You can download, you can read our summaries of all of the papers at the end. And in most cases, we found live and legal links to the papers, yeah. not in all of them. Um, but yeah, so feel free. And basically, we're looking for academics to say, you can make it better by doing this. We've already spoken to quite a few. We're looking for people to say, actually, that's really interesting. I'd like to learn more about X, Y, or Z. So yeah, please download it. We'd love you to um, and share that around. Um, and with a bit of luck as well, we'll be bringing that into more leadership work. So as an organization, we're gonna be doing more work on uh, leadership training. Um, we're waiting to find out if we get to be one of the new NPQ trainers, but even if not, we're gonna be doing more work with school leaders, middle leaders, et cetera, to kind of get some of these insights and help people hopefully put some of them into practice as well. That sounds exciting. 
All right. It's very exciting. Mildly yeah. scary. No, very scary, but very yeah. exciting. Well, we've got lots of thank yous in the chat box, David. So, um, I, has anyone else got any questions? I did, I've got one about videoing, by the way. Um, so, recording lessons. My final question, by the way, I just because I've got Dave Weston on the on the virtual line, literally. I just want to make full use of it. Um, so to, what, to, what, to what extent then do you think video lessons um, are a key tool or, or, or lever, if you will, to support teacher development? Um, hmm, really interesting question. I mean, I, I guess it depends. Um, you know, the video lesson can go anything from the absolutely appalling. Um, I've kind of forced this on you. Uh, and I'm going to make a judgment based on what's happening. Um, you know, there, there could be some really, really bad things. Um, at the same time, I also think that um, if you have invited someone to help you video and you really thought about what you expect to see and you've got, a, you've done it a few times, so you've got over the, oh my God, I sound terrible in an audio, which just takes a few goes, you get used to it. Um, and then you get to the stage where you're actually looking at what happened and you can see the different perspectives and you're discussing the different clips and you can use that to share with other colleagues, to share your planning and thinking. I think that can be really useful and doesn't necessarily need amazing technology, but it does need some you know, good platforms and good security and good agreements and those sorts of things. Um, so, I mean, I'm a great believer in video tech um, and I would definitely, again, I often play the mystery school. Someone has just somehow given me a school to be the head of and what would I do? And definitely like investing in video technology would be one of the things that I would do um, without a doubt. Um, so yeah, that would be my thoughts. Can you buy uh, one of the things that like track the teacher? I mean, it's so cool. I say I love tech, but it's one of those where it's got to be cost efficient and it's actually got to be effective at, at developing teachers. And that, that, that's the whole purpose of, of, of introducing this sort of tech is to actually develop us as practitioners. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit, I think the thing is, I don't it doesn't have to be big investment, does it anymore? Like you can literally buy like a, a phone stand and put it yeah. on and, you know, if you've got, yeah, the, you've got the appropriate rights, I suppose, to, to do Yeah, it. I agree. I agree. Um, very important question came through. What's the best 90s banger? Um, yeah. I'm going to go with this one, actually. Uh, Live in joy, don't stop moving. Uh, it's just amazing. Absolutely brilliant song. Um, is it the best one? I don't know. It's the one that just came to my mind right then. Um, go and have a listen anyway, and you'll just be you'll be transported back to the 90s. Someone's probably going to point out it's like 80s or 2000s now, but I hope not. Cracking. Song. Are the links in the chat box as well? Is that to the song? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I was multitasking all my way through that last answer. I'm just going to say I was answering your question on video and finding live and joy. Don't stop moving. David, I'm impressed. Please. 95. Thank you. 1995. What a year. I mean, it couldn't be more 90s, could it? So there we go. Um, I don't remember it, but I, yeah, I, I believe it was good. I so believe it was good. I'm against music. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, there we go. Christina, I don't know if I was task switching or multitasking. I just don't know. Uh, it depends how com how coherent my answer about video was. Oh. I don't know. Um, a good example of, of you, David, the expert as a presenter. There we go. You see, I could basically waffle about yeah. automaticity, carry on while I randomly found a video and live in joy. See, that's where automaticity is a great thing. I probably need to save my voice now and actually uh, uh, and, yeah. and log off because um, I'm doing more training tomorrow on the TDT CPD leadership course. So that's very exciting. But thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. This has been really fun. No, and, thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. And I want to come to Lincolnshire. I want to do more things. So by hook or by crook. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> and we're recording as well. So we get... David, look, you said. <laughs> come to Lincolnshire. Yeah, I'm gonna go tell my partner that now. So yeah, edu, edu capital. David, thank you very much. Um, Great stuff. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. You take care. Have a good one. Oh, shall I press end on this, or shall I hand the hosting back to you? I, I, I don't mind. Do I hand it back to me? And I'll. When do you, I'm gonna make you host. There we go. Yes. Boom. I'm host. All right. Wow. Brilliant. Thanks so much, everybody. David. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye, bye. Bye. That was cool, wasn't it? Can you, are you still recording? Just stop. Stop. Yes.